Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, I'm Catherine Marshall. I usually live in Washington, D.C., but I'm speaking from Provo, Utah. Uh, the purpose of this event is to focus on the very fast approaching uh, G20 summit, which will take place in Rio de Janeiro in late November. Uh, and the uh, challenge is for all communities, but particularly in our case, religious communities, to provide their analysis and their highly their priority recommendations to the G20 leaders, the leaders of the most powerful countries and networks uh, in the world as they meet in late November. Uh, we're doing a series of five webinars, uh, which are basically addressing the priority questions. What's the problem? Uh, what does it have to do with religious communities, religious teachings, religious beliefs? Uh, what does it have to do with the G20? And how does that fit with so many other events that are happening? And what do we see as the priority ideas and recommendations? So last week, we focused on issues of food and poverty. And next week, at the same time, we will be focusing on issues of climate and environment, uh, and later looking at issues of human trafficking and modern slavery, and finally, social cohesion and education. So for this uh, event this morning, in the hour, it is being recorded. Uh, I will turn this to Eric LeConte, uh, who leads an important organization, uh, Jubilee USA, who will introduce uh, the speakers and who will provide us uh, with that overview. You are most welcome to put questions uh, in the Q&A uh, button. Uh, we will, I don't think, have time to address the questions online but we'll look at them and come back to you with those questions in the future. So with that, uh, thank you, Eric. Uh, you're um, an admirable, uh, inspirational leader, uh, and we pass this over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and it's an incredible gift to be working with you, the Berkeley Center, and the G20 Interfaith Forum. Uh, on these critical issues that are important to the faith community, to the labor community, and the business community. Issues which impact our lives almost as much as the very oxygen we breathe. As we begin today, uh, I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge uh, the presence of the Creator among us. Uh, the reality that as we are all beginning pilgrimage towards the Jubilee year uh, that God is with us, God is among us, God is in us. And from the wisdom of the ancient mystics, which carries us into the Jubilee year, mystics from all faith traditions, there is a universal saying uh, as we approach these critical issues impacting all people on planet Earth, and that is as we continue, as we go forward, wherever we are and however we act, we go with God. And I think that sense of going with God is really at the heart of what religious leaders are calling for right now in terms of this great time of pilgrimage and answering the faith-based call to end poverty, to address inequality and heal our broken planet home. It's a real gift to be presenting this panel today uh, and to offer the overview that Catherine suggested. Uh, in terms of background, uh, many of us have been involved in the Global Jubilee Movement, as well as focusing on the policies that impact people and planet uh, for most of our lifetimes. Um, right now, we head into uh, Jubilee 2025, and this webinar, uh, along with being in partnership with the G20 Interfaith Forum, will also be a part of a series of Jubilee webinars as we continue pilgrimage towards the Jubilee year. More than 25 years ago, religious leaders came together, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, joined by the labor community, 
by the environmental community and by the business community to heed the call of major religious leaders in the mid 1990s. Perhaps the strongest call first came from Pope John Paul II in 1997, as we approached Jubilee 2000, remembering that 2000 years ago was the birth of Jesus Christ. John Paul II and other faith leaders encouraged us to return to the Hebrew and Christian scriptures and dive into the true meaning of Jubilee. Jubilee is one of the primary themes uh, in both the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, and those themes are also echoed throughout the Quran and other major religious traditions. Our story begins in Genesis, the reality that our God loves us so much that God created a rich and abundant world, and we're closest to one another. We're closest to the creator when we're sharing those resources among us. And John Paul reminded us to look at the scripture because what the scripture called for after the world was created in seven days in order to provide for us, what the scripture tells is a continuing story reminding people to go with God, to be with God, to be among God, and to share God's resources that God has provided among us. That story continues in the Hebrew scriptures, uh, in the law books, in the Torah, where every seven years, debts are forgiven. Every seven years, slaves are set free. Every seven years, people are to return to their ancestral home, their lands, and allow the earth to rest, allow it to go fallow, so God can perfect, provide directly for us, uh, and we can heal planet in a continual cycle. And every seven times seven years uh, in the Torah is the great year of restoration, the great Jubilee year, when we have a continual process that protects all of us from becoming too rich or too poor. Slaves are set free, debts are forgiven, enough economic aid is provided for all, and we allow our planet to heal and rest. That idea was so important to the early believers Scriptural scholars argue that as many as communities as large of 100,000 people lived their daily lives by these laws. But we forget about these laws, and that's why the prophets came, to remind them of the message. And then in the Gospel of Luke, when Jesus begins his ministry in the synagogue, he reads from the Jubilee Scripture, from the prophet Isaiah. Again, noting that debts will be forgiven, slaves will be set free, and we will have a world where we all live with God and our creation. And we know from the scripture that the crowd was baffled. They are like, hey, isn't this the day laborer? And he's coming to the synagogue today to tell us that he is here to end all inequality now. That idea becomes a primary theme for people of faith and is echoed throughout the scriptures. And John Paul II, Muslim, Jewish, other leaders raised the message in the mid 1990s to say, now we must forgive debts. We must provide a continual process in order that people have enough and our planet can be protected. Out of that work more than 30 years ago, the groups represented on this call won more than $130 billion in debt relief. 54 million kids are going to school in Africa who never would have seen the inside of a classroom. And where we accomplished much during that time, all of our agenda was not accomplished. Several weeks ago, Pope Francis reminded us of the agenda as we approach Jubilee 2025. And he said, we are called to do three things in his fundamental speech that he gave in early June on the Jubilee year and continues to extrapolate on the papal bull in terms of the meaning of Jubilee. That right now, in addition to being in a pilgrimage of faith for the Jubilee year, that we are going with God on this pilgrimage, we must also, again, remember that message. And number one, what we must do is have enough debt relief to deal with the world's global financial crisis. And even more importantly, what Pope Francis raised, which 
he told the United Nations in 2015, which we tell people was the most important speech Pope Francis ever gave, but no one really ever, ever understood, is that we need to finish the unfinished business from the Jubilee year of 2000 and enact significant changes to the financial system, create a global bankruptcy process that can protect the poor and the planet. Number two, Pope Francis said, during the Jubilee year and the years that follow, we must work to move forward sufficient economic aid to end global poverty. And third, Pope Francis says, we cannot separate Jubilee 2025 from the great climate crisis our world is dealing with. And it's up to us through debt relief and other creative economic aid to win all of the money, the trillions we need for financing climate mitigation and adaptation. So what does that mean in the current context? As Catherine asks, as we all ask, what does it mean for us as people of faith on this moment, on this pilgrimage that we are embarking upon together? It means that those real policies that Pope Francis raised, that Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, and other religious leaders are raising will be decided in our lifetimes by the G20, the G7, and the International Monetary Fund. And as important as the work is at the United Nations of building consensus, we know that the most significant decisions around debt relief, around funding the multilateral uh, uh, development banks to get enough economic aid to everywhere around the world where it's needed, about the actual financing for climate mitigation and adaptation, those decisions will not be made at the United Nations. They'll be made at the G7 in Canada next year. They'll be made at the G20 this year in Brazil and in South Africa next year. We know that these decisions are going to be made at the IMF and all of the world leaders engaged, all of the presidents and prime ministers, the head of the International Monetary Fund know that this is a jubilee year and they're already promising to give us cups of water. But what's incumbent upon us on this pilgrimage is to note cups are helpful, but not enough. What we need for this global financial crisis, for the debt crisis, for the climate crisis, for the food and energy crisis, what we need now that will be enough is buckets of water, buckets and buckets and a waterfall of water, because we as a people are thirsty. We as a people need to drink and have enough. And that leads us into the actual technical discussions. Sometimes it's difficult to understand these groupings, these major, these major world leaders and the power they have. Through Jubilee 2000, we changed how the global financial system operates, but we didn't do enough. Jubilee 2025 is our opportunity to do more. And what's incredibly exciting about the faith leaders represented on this panel is organizing has already begun or is beginning in more than 160 countries around the world, led by faith leaders, faith-based institutions, and faith-based communities. We are here to join them on pilgrimage as we continue our pilgrimage to Brazil this year and next year when they have the climate meetings, our pilgrimage to Canada for the G7 meetings next year, and our vital pilgrimage to the G20 meetings in South Africa next year. We're picking up this call as we did 30 years ago to move forward a multi-year campaign that wins the Jubilee promise, the world that God promised us, where we're all protected from having too little or too much. With that, we'd like to open up uh, this panel today uh, to our panelists who are going to speak about some of the critical issues uh, of our time uh, and these particular issues that they are raising right now. Uh, we'll get into the actual decisions that are being made at the G20 
and the G7. Uh, it's important to note the Africa communities that we've been working with and that are leading much of this effort released a powerful jubilee statement, taking Pope Francis's words and breaking it down to the technical policies in Kigali, when faith leaders of Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Hindu, and traditional faith groups came together to issue this statement for Africa for the jubilee year. So today, we're talking about the problem. We're talking about the G20, the IMF, the G7, and we have those religious institutions and leaders on the front lines in Africa who are going to share with us today wisdom on very particular issues, not only about what we're called to as a faith community to end poverty, to address inequality, and to protect our planet, but to bring those issues down to the technical decisions that we can move at the G20 this year, next year, and in the years to come. We're joined today by Dr. Mercy John, the National Secretary of the Women Wing of Christian Council of Nigeria, who will speak about the links in the G20 to climate and tax. We're joined by Reverend um, Sister Professor Eugenia Amporfu, economist, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, Ghana, who will speak about the debt issues that we're facing. We are joined by Haj Amir Ahmed Mangali, the Regional Programs Coordinator for East Africa Islamic Relief to offer the Islamic insight into these questions and the links to the humanitarian issues we're called to solve during this moment as we are on pilgrimage into Jubilee 2025. And finally, we'll be joined by Father Charles Chalufa, uh, a Jesuit, Director of the Justice and Ecology Office of the Jesuit Conference of Africa and Madagascar. He will speak to accountability and what we will look to this November and carry on to South Africa. So without further ado, I'm not sure that we have Sister um, uh, uh, um, Eugenia with us yet. I know she was going to join a little bit late. So Dr. Mercy John uh, of the National Secretary of the Women Wing of the Christian Council of Nigeria, I'd like to invite you to begin this morning to talk about the G20 and international financial links to climate and attacks. Good afternoon, everyone. I am meant to understand that it is morning at your place, but it's afternoon in my place. So good afternoon, and uh, I am so happy to be here once again. Uh, I want to appreciate uh, and do not take this for granted for giving me this platform to be able to air my view concerning this great auspicious um, event that is reoccurring and is a good thing to do because we need to put some, some things in place and also to be able to amplify the voice of the voiceless and be able to say exactly what it is facing the whole world and Africa at large. Uh, you know, the, the, the G20 Interfaith Forum is a very good platform for us to be able to bring out all that needed to be said. And then for all other African leaders, world leaders, the traditional leaders, the religious leaders, and everybody that will be coming to that conferences would have one or two things to go with. So therefore, whatever we are saying here right now, we plead with you to take it down to the G20 so that our voices will be heard and there will be great change after the Jubilee by his grace and by the grace of God. I am particularly here to talk on the climate issue of climate change and tax in particular. I was saddled with that topic and I would like to go through it very briefly within the shortest time that has been allocated to us We'll go straight to the point without much ado. Now, when we talk about the climate, we all understand what climate means. It simply refers to a long time shift in temperature and weather patterns. And over the years, the nature of climate change has been inter in 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 interfered by human activities. Climate change is, of course, one of the um, efforts that brings a kind of um, uh, economic downtown to a country, if not well managed. So therefore we must 
consider the issue of climate change a very serious issue. And then we have some remedies on how to be able to curb this situation and not to get the a whole um, um, situation into uh, a, a platform whereby we cannot salvage ourselves anymore. We need to address it very quickly for us to be able to come to the a, a limeline of what needed to be done and how we need to improve our economics and other things around the climate change. And I will talk about the climate change has its own effect. One, we talk about the rising average temperature. When the climate changes, you are bound to see the rigid average climate temperature, it becomes unusual, unbearable, and this affects even the heart situation of uh, an individual. We also talk about the increase in frequency and uh, intensity of extra weather events, such as the drought. You begin to have a, have a drought, you have a, a wide fires, fire outbreaks, and then you have strong winds because the climate has been affected somewhere, somehow. Therefore, it has its effect on us. And now we talk about the ocean acidification and sea level would definitely rise. Why? Because the climate has been affected somewhere and somehow. Then we have the destruction, the destructions of ecosystem and loss of biodiversity. And you, and you, and you come to understand that even the land that we plant, even the agriculture that we are supposed to have, because of the effect of that climate change, we may not be able to have exactly what is supposed to be sufficient for even everybody to be able to have it as in forms of food supply. Then we have food security challenge. Due to climate change, you have that the food will not be sufficient. Your food will not be available for people so for the demands of the people to be reached to, and therefore hunger will erupt such land. Then we have a threat of health. It also affects our health wise, then particularly for the vulnerable populations. When we talk about the vulnerable populations, we talk about the age ones, we talk about those below five years. They are actually the vulnerable populated uh, people that this climate change will greatly also affect. Then when we look at that, what will be the, the remedy? The solutions to all of this problem that has been listed or short line. Yes, addressing climate change requires a concerted effort across multiple sectors and levels of governance, stakeholders like the religious leaders. The religious leader has a very key role to play in terms of the climate change. How? By using the platform that God has given them as a leader, either Islamic leader, a traditional leader either a Christian leader, you have your followers. There are terms you meet. The Bible made us to understand it said, do not hesitate in coming together to fellowship together. So in that avenue of that fellowship, you have the voice to talk to people, the dangers of, of climate change, the effects of climate change, and the remedies and things that need to be done to be able to improve our climate uh, uh, situation. Now, some of the dangers of some of those things, I mean, solutions that could also be able to curb some of those things that, that have been listed earlier, we look at one, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions is very important. That we have a reduction of greenhouse emission by facing out the use of fossil fuels. Then promoting rem renewable energy source, such as the wind source, the solar, the hydro powers can be introduced instead of always being under greenhouse gas emissions. Then we looked at also encouraging energy efficiency measures. This will also be one of the solutions as a remedy to some of this problem that has been listed. Then we looked at two, production and restoration of natural system. When we look about we we'll talk about the production and restoration of natural system. We we'll look at preserving and restoring the ecosystem, the coastal, the forest, grassland that has been cut down, that has been affected, that has been streamlined. We need to restore them. We need to bring them to preserve them because they have the enhanced carbon sequential capabilities because it will help us protect the land protect even the human being without causing any harm. They will talk about implementing conservation-based solutions. 
it's also very important. Then we look at another point as industrial transformation. When we talk about the industrial transformation, we're trying to look at the improving the industrial practices to minimize greenhouse gas emissions, supporting research and innovation in low carbon technologies. We need to go into research of what and what we need to do more to be able to support these gas emissions by improving the industrial practices to minimize the greenhouse uh, gas uh, emission. Then we looked at four adaptations of and, and, and measures. Developing resilience to current and anticipated climate impact, enhancing disaster preparedness and their response capacity. When you develop measures or develop resistance to current anticipation of uh, uh, climate impact, you will be able to do what? To resist at least and also improve the capacity of the climate. Then we looked at the, four point, uh, the fifth point as the global cooperation and religious leaders. This has to do with a multilateral uh, 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 actions. Every hands has to be on this to see that the issue of global, uh, global uh, uh, climate change is a top priority that we need to take it very seriously because it has its way of bringing positivities to our life, to our activities in our uh, in terms of our, our full storage, in terms of the development of the country and all of those things that need to be addressed. It will help. So it's a collective responsibility. The government has to come together, or the stakeholders has to come together, the religious has to come together to sit down, just like the G20 Interfaith Forum is doing. That is a great one. We need to keep amplifying the voice. It's not over until it's over. We keep talking. We shouldn't relent our effort. This and every day, I think we, we, we have been saying this, and we will keep saying it on uh, encourage the religious leaders to. to to wake up to this call and take it very seriously all over the country. I think we lost the connection, maybe. We did. I, I'm uh, very sorry if we can return to Dr. Mercy at the end. I know that she was uh, wrapping up uh, her comments, um, but I, I think those comments are very important as we continue on with this webinar this morning, in particular when we highlight two realities. Um, long uh, from our partners in the South, Jubilee South, uh, as well as echoed by our partners in the North, uh, we have said that for more than 25 years, the North really owes a debt to the South. And Pope Francis is echoing that very strongly. But it's a climate debt that Pope Francis is talking about and that our partners that through the process of industrialization, enormous resources and wealth in the 1800s were raised in the North, uh, but it also spurred climate change. And now the debt is Southern countries, most countries in the world do not have the resources to finance climate mitigation and adaptation. And we need to repay that debt from the North by ensuring that's possible. One of the reports that Jubilee USA is currently supporting is looking at the trillions of dollars that needs to be raised for climate mitigation and adaptation. And we're finding even among the wealthiest countries in the world, even among advanced economies, that very few actually have the resources to deal with climate mitigation and adaptation. It's why these G20 meetings are so critical right now. The other issue that Dr. Mercy was alluding to was on the tax issue, and that the G20 and G7 have endorsed a corporate minimum tax, that tax is too small, but tax issues are incredibly important if we're going to raise the money we need to deal with poverty, inequality, climate, and fulfilling the sustainable development goals. With that said, we now turn to our next speaker. Um, I don't believe Sister Eugenia has joined us quite yet. Um, so I'd like to turn um, now to uh, Amir, um, where Amir will uh, be able to speak to uh, the realities, excuse me, um, the realities of the Muslim point of view, uh, as well as looking at the reality uh, of uh, humanitarian issues as they face the G7 and G20. Amir from Islamic Relief, I turn it to you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of Allah, 
most gracious, most merciful. Uh, I'm very happy to join this conversation on a very crucial topic, which you have uh, presented to us. And we have to contribute from a faith perspective as a faith organization. We are all a creation of God and we have to exist within the confines that God put us and we should not transgress, transgress the borders. We should not go beyond the limits. The Quran says in chapter 16, verse 125, invite all the way of your Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching. As we plan to go to the G20 in Brazil, we need to have a good speech to talk to our uh, stakeholders over there. We have to use these beautiful words that can, you know, give them the appetite to listen. And we have to do it using wisdom. And the Quran says in chapter 25, verse 63, that the true servants of the most compassionate are those who walk on the earth humbly. We are, we are living in the world where, where there is turmoil, there is a lot of uncertainties and it becomes a problem for all of us who live in this world to see how we can continue existing without any hindrances. Islamic belief believes that the alleviation of poverty is crucial to enhancing adaptive capacity, building resilience, and reducing vulnerability. Our work is mainly concerned with enabling and encouraging social strategies that would be most effective at helping families adapt to the changes in the climate. As a humanitarian organization, we work with people at the grassroots level. We stay with them, we work with them, we understand them, and therefore, when they get uh, affected by any disaster of whatsoever nature, we are there with them. So we better understand them more than people who are from afar. So this one brings us to uh, elements of long-term resilience of these communities, especially that we empower communities so that they can actually adapt the situations in which they find themselves in. Personally, growing and living in Africa, I have witnessed a transition from foreign aid grant dependency to a more desperate and inevitable debt acquisition. It's now clear that to finance, to finance any, any, any endeavor, you require economic act, uh, uh, experts at the cost of servicing debts skyrocketed due to high interest. And most of our countries are on the verge of defaulting, or defaulting or they already started defaulting. How can then our countries finance their own investments when they are actually struggling to repay their loans rather than investing on the essential services like health, water, education, and basic infrastructures, infrastructure in the communities in which they find themselves. I participated in the Jubilee 2025 recently in Kigali, and our quest to advocate for debt relief, we are convinced that as faith-based organization, we have a contributing perspective through civic engagement, because all our goal is to lessen this burden of debt. Now, in some countries, financial stability is not easy because they are already engulfed in conflicts and, and these conflicts have actually hindered prospects to secure environment an environment that nurtures food production, that uh, which, which is a, 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 a big factor because food insecurity is almost in every community. Now, 
climate crisis manifestation uh, with cyclic natural disasters, including pandemics. Um, COVID-19 was here. We saw the, the, the devastating impact of it. Right now we are having small, I mean, um, the, 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 the monkeypox and many others uh, to, uh, to name. Uh, we had HIV for a long, long time. So now all these, when they come, especially the African community, they have re they leave devastating effects on the communities. And the means to cope up is always perfect. As a worker of a faith-based organization, we put the Islamic uh, word of uh, rahma. Rahma means compassion at the, at the center of our interventions. If we don't feel compassion for each other, then we have to open a door for brutality to our communities, um, leave them in despair, etc., etc. We should not be the case. So we are trying to make sure that the poor and the vulnerable communities, most of who thrive in local rural economy, they use the, relate, the, 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 the resources at our at their disposal to increase production and eliminate any source of damage, loss or suffering. But when disasters happen, what happens? It is the opposite. Vulnerable communities are actually those who find themselves living in the hardest areas, what we call hard to reach. They are not only hard to reach, but also hard to reconstruct whenever a disaster comes, uh, uh, comes up. Suffering increases and the means to cope are all, almost not there. So in this case, we are saying that as faith-based uh, organization, we are actually appealing to our supporters in good faith. They have to come to a rescue. They have to develop this conscience of minding about the people who are in suffering. Um, I've seen that in Africa, uh, from the African Development Bank, the debt is almost 824 billion. This investment, if it was put in actual use, meaningful use, then our countries would not be complicated. But now the worry has gone up. There's a lot of anxiety. As a religious organization or in our teachings, we must always preach. We do that psychosocial. We, we, we want healing to happen. We need to restore hope, okay? But this cannot be done without, without the political way. Therefore, we are also appealing to the government, those that lend and those that borrow to make sure that they certainly don't divert the resources that they're given. And in this case, we go a little bit further and we look at the legislations. If they are favorable, those that are loaning and those that are being loaned, if there is a favorable win-win situation in terms of the legislation that governs the loaning and the lending, probably this could also help in one way or the other to lessen the debt burden or the tension to pay the debt for that matter. We believe as Islamic Leaf that Jubilee 20. 25 African faith leaders plea for debt cancellation is very paramount at this time around. And we have the, the resolute to further the quest for the same as we go ahead in the subsequent meetings and interactions. In our faith, serving the vulnerable communities with, with compassion is cherished. And we are also cognizant that restructuring post-disaster resilient development should be by the government. This is, should be the shoulders of the government, should be the responsibility of the government. Apparently, due to heavy indebtedness, and this responsibility has faded, thus leaving everything to the suffering communities in their own situation as they are. Islamically, in one of the policy documents, and I read that we need collaborative action and investment. Collaboration across sectors 
initiatives and levels to ensure that different initiatives and different sources for funding humanitarian assistance development, disaster risk reduction, green, green recovery funds, ETC, are needed to support the endeavors and avoid duplication. We can have good practices in the, all the interventions that we do so as to pursue a better world where we can all live in and enjoy with the hope. Finally, I will quote from the Quran, chapter 16, verse 65, and that and Allah has sent down rain from the sky and given life thereby to the earth after its lifelessness. Indeed, in that is a sign for people who listen. So we are saying the G20 in Brazil and subsequent forums conventions, we need them to listen. If we have to revive the earth, given this uh, 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 wise, um, I mean, um, wisdom from the Quran, because a drop of water revive, re revives life. So if they listen and they change, they drop that water, metaphorically, it can be a way of restoring our hope and the continuity of life. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Haji Amir Ahmed Mangala from Islamic Relief for offering that vital perspective, the Islamic perspective, the humanitarian issues we're facing and reminding us that the G20 in Brazil, the IMF, the G7 in Canada, and as we head to the G20 in South Africa next year, we're dealing with a crisis in Africa alone of nearly a trillion dollars in debt. And because of the interest rates for many countries across Africa, those debts are no longer payable. Um, we now would like to turn um, to uh, Sister Eugenia. Good afternoon. My name is Sister Eugenia Ampofo from Ghana, Kumase, Ghana. And uh, <clears throat> um, I'm happy that the, the panel is discussing this very important topic on um, debts in my focus in developing countries, but my focus is going to be on Africa. Africa is made up of many developing countries, and so whatever pertains to Africa also pertains to developing countries as well. So basically, my um, um, topic is going to focus on why international cooperation is needed for sovereign, sovereign debt um, management. Let's first look at the debt in Africa. It's about, it's about 1.8 trillion, which sounds like a lot of money, but it is not because it is even less than that of Germany. That is um, 2.9 um, trillion US dollars in 2023. That's only last year. When you look at the debt GDP, the debt GDP ratio for Africa, it ranges for the African countries in general, it ranges between 13.3 for Congo and 256. Uh, percent for um, Sudan, and and so these are uh, some many of these countries have debt GDP ratio below those of developed countries that are as you can see are also very high, and and so uh, the question is what's the big deal? The big deal of the African um, debt that is a problem that needs a lot of management is the debt structure. More than 60% of African debt are owned by foreigners, which means that you have to buy, you have to sell your local currency and buy foreign currencies to be able to service your debt and even make the principal payments. Okay. And currently this year alone, um, Africa is supposed to pay about 163 billion US dollars in debt service. And many of the bonds that were issued ago the time time ago are all due. They've all matured this year. So this year is a big year for debt servicing and debt management. Um, the the problem with um, the debt servicing using the foreign currency is that it leads to the depreciation of the domestic currency. As more of the domestic currency is sold to buy um, foreign currency, not only to service debt and to pay for the services um, for the matured debt, 
but also to import other goods and services needed for production and for development in the domestic um, economy. This leads to inflation. So in addition to the what we call the exchange rate risk, the depreciation of the domestic currency, we also have a second consequence, that is inflation. And this is observed in many African countries that are struggling with debt and with exchange rate depreci depreciation of their currency in addition to high inflation. And that is impeding economic growth. And when economic growth doesn't occur, it also impedes the ability to pay. Hence, the need to um, manage the debt that is accumulating over the years. And um, this has been done. This has been done not too long ago. In 2021, um, we had this temporary one, the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, especially around the COVID period. And that, But that was a, a temporary one. We need a more permanent debt relief. That's basically what we need. When you look at um, under normal circumstances, um, governments are supposed to use their tax revenue to pay for these debts, but many countries in Africa are struggling to raise the necessary tax revenue. They are just peanut, nothing to write home about. And so this doesn't help in bringing down the debt that is accumulating over time. Hence the need for debt relief. That would be a good management of the debt of these developing countries. Um, the problem is that sometimes, even apart from trying to pay with their income, their tax revenue, and if that doesn't work, they may have to come and borrow to be able to service their debt. The problem is that with poor credit worthiness, because of the accumulated debt, the credit worthiness is very poor. And because it's so poor, it makes further borrowing even more expensive. Many African countries are rated be below non-investment grade, highly speculative in default and junk. And that makes it very difficult for them to be able to borrow. And you can see some of the examples um, on the slide. Um, the, the, when it comes to debt relief, you need the creditors around the same table to discuss. <clears throat> the debt relief. The problem is that the composition of the creditors is, is really different this time because most of the creditors are private creditors. And this could be individuals, private companies somewhere. And it's difficult to bring all of them at the same time to the round table for discussion. And that makes it difficult, but it is not impossible for them to get them together. If we can get one, like the multilateral um, um of an agency like the G G20, this can be done to coordinate these um, credit creditors. It is possible. Now, let me make a point that um, debt relief is not charity. Debt relief is not charity because when you're holding a bond of a particular country and the country is has a very poor uh, credit worthiness, the market price of that bond goes down. When there is debt relief, it actually reduces the, the stock of that country and increases the market price. So it benefits, debt relief benefits the holder of the bond. And the reason why some creditors will, will drag their feet in joining such discussion is that when they do not participate and the others participate by reducing their own debt, um, the overall increase in the price of the, of the bonds of that particular um, country um, affects everybody else, whether the person participated or did not participate. So those who bragging that could be trying to to free ride on those who participate. That is why they are not in there. So let's try to get all of them together so that everybody will be able to take part and 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 get the thing going. And so what should the faith community do? The faith community is doing the right thing by trying to get um, G20 to coordinate this kind of discussion, to get them to come up with a debt relief. And we need, in addition to that, um, the faith community needs to work with government to come up with more transparent tax system and simple tax system and encourage people in the developing countries, the citizenry, to pay their tax 
when when it's transparent it's much easier to pay because you see what your money is being used for this is very important we need the, the faith uh, leaders to be able to do that and then the credit ratings that these countries get especially in africa can be very biased and goes against them so that also needs to be looked at again and my third my last um, point a recommendation for faith leaders sounds a little um, unrealistic but something that we may start to think about how can we get these countries developing countries to borrow from the foreign countries but in the currencies of the domestic countries maybe you can do it through commodity market or something but something that we need to discuss thank you very much for your time and i i i hope this will bear good fruit thank you I certainly can reflect on the vital debt issues that Sister Eugenia, from not only a faith perspective, but her very strong perspective as an economist, uh, in terms of the issues that are in front of the G20 as we uh, continue on this pilgrimage that is in Brazil, and the pilgrimage continues next year to the G20 uh, in South Africa. Um, when we uh, talk about the actual debt issues. Part of what we are talking about uh, has to do very specifically uh, with the kinds of deliberations in front of the G20. And they have been the primary group that has been the decision-making power, not only on debt relief and debt relief processes, but also on this idea of special drawing rights, this $650 billion, which we won during the pandemic, uh, to be able to support developing countries. Um, so that is a critical issue which remains in front of the G20, special drawing rights. Uh, debt relief, uh, which has moved forward under the G20 and IMF in very limited ways to the poorest countries, uh, also saw the G20 erect during the pandemic a new process uh, called the Common Framework. Uh, the common framework, we believe, along with many world leaders, has largely failed, but that was to create a new mechanism and process uh, in order to ensure countries not only had the de uh, debt relief they needed, but sufficient economic aid to be able to deal with challenges for providing um, for their people. Uh, the reality is, uh, is while that process still is being worked on and can be improved, a lot of work needs to be done to improve that process and to make it more uh, effective, efficient, accountable, and transparent. The reality that's facing the G20 and G20, G7 and International Monetary Fund right now uh, are discussions around what they're referring to as international financial architecture reform. And it is within these discussions that the global bankruptcy process that Pope Francis raised again in June and July, that process he raised at the United Nations, a process raised by Benedict, Pope John Paul II, and other major religious leaders is part of the most important work that remains unfinished from Jubilee 2000. That concept uh, of a bankruptcy process is directly connected to continual processes from the Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Uh, and this process actually does at this point enjoy significant support in the G20, but not majority support to be able to move it forward. 25 years ago, when we began the campaign for Jubilee 2000, 30 million petitions around the world were signed, largely by faith communities in Africa, Asia, Latin America. Uh, and these petitions not only called for debt cancellation, but they called for the necessity of implementing a global bankruptcy process and framework, a permanent process to be able to deal with debt and financial crisis, a process that can protect us all. So it is in with this technical discussion of international financial architecture, um, that the IMF will release a new paper next year for the Jubilee year, that the G20 and G7 will be moving forward and making decisions on, we on our pilgrimage need to push very strongly for the unfinished business of Jubilee 2005, which is not only global debt cancellation, not only sufficient economic aid like special drawing rights and multilateral development bank aid to end global poverty, 
not only the financing that's needed for climate mitigation and adaptation, but the critical unfinished business is establishing a global bankruptcy process that can protect all of us from having too little or too much and offer what we need to heal our planet. So now we'll hear from Father Charles Chalufa, the director of the Jesuit, uh, or the Justice and Ecology Office of the Jesuit Conference of Africa uh, and Madagascar. Um, Charlie is going to share with us some of the accountability issues and what we're looking at in terms of November and what we need to carry through to South Africa. And before Charlie uh, continues, uh, let me just apologize for some of the, uh, the technical issues that we've faced this morning. Um, Father Charlie, to you. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry, my internet is very choppy. Uh, uh, um, a midway going somewhere, but I stopped somewhere to uh, adequately have this, but let's see. Um, anyway, as you think about um, South Africa, I would like to draw uh, our attention back to the powerful words of Mandela at the launch of um, the Make Poverty History in 2005. Um, Mandela said very powerful words one, when he said, uh, in 2005 in London, overcoming poverty is not a task of charity. It is an act of justice. So as we, if, as we uh, cast this vision of 2025 and think about what we, we should do and the role of the G20 in 2025 and going ahead, I would like to call back this spirit of Mandela, a champion of justice that what we are doing is we're not promoting charity, but something that is important for all human beings. As we are taught in the Christian Bible, that we do what is good. Huh? Um, this is what the Lord ask, asks of us, to do justice, to love kindness, and to humbly to walk humbly with God. So whatever we are dealing with here uh, is a, a realization that poverty, like slavery and apathy, are not natural. It is, poverty is man-made or human-made, and it can be overcome by the deliberate actions of human beings. And as Eric said at the in during his opening words, uh, this is something that the G20 can do, they are poised to do, and they are, have an opportunity to do. So as we stand on the precipice of what could be the most significant economic transformation in our history, we must be guided by the, not by the echoes of colonial legacies, but by the chorus of our co collective actions toward justice and um, uh, equity. Uh, the heart of the matter is that Africa is a continent rich in resources, yet many of our countries are burdened by debts, as we have heard, that throttle our growth and stifle our people's uh, aspiration. So, Debt relief, uh, we are, uh, debt relief we are calling for is not a mere act of aid. It is an act of liberation, as we heard. This is jubilee. We need liberation. Many of our people are shackled and they are not free uh, because of the debts that their countries have. Because of these debts, their countries are not able to provide for them what they need in terms of social services like health education, water, and other forms of infrastructure. That's in slavery. That's slavery. They, our people are enslaved. Therefore, it is essential for breathing life back into our economies. Uh, Jubilee is breathing life into our economies. Pope Francis speaks a lot about creating economies that uh, provide life or promote life rather than economies that kill. So Jubilee is a, is a moment of recreation. Huh? Uh, if you follow the theology of cre uh, creation in the Christian tradition or, or Hebrew tradition, God breathed life, uh, breathed life uh, into chaos. So at the moment we are in chaos, we are in, in uh, a moment of disturbance that needs that spirit of God, that needs that refreshing uh, uh, breath. And that's what uh, responsible leaders can do to co-create with God, to, to breathe that new life with God onto uh, 
uh, uh, onto the earth so that we can have freedom uh, once again, so that tax justice uh, prevail, so that uh, our nations can receive their fair dues from local and multinational uh, uh, entities. Um, so uh, as we look forward to uh, South Africa, really, we are reminded that Jubilee 2025 is not just a call for policy changes. It is a moral imperative. It is about correcting. And thank you very much to Father Charlie for those important comments. For the last three years, many of the groups that are on this call today have been organizing um, for Jubilee 2025, noting that the South Africa presidency will be so significant and knowing the greater power and growing power that the Africa Union now has as part of the G20. Uh, some of our partners and colleagues in Africa now refer to the G20 as the G21 because the Africa Union has an official membership and voice. Um, with that, uh, before thanking our panelists, let me just turn to Catherine to see if there's anything else that should be mentioned uh, in our closing today. Thank you, Eric, and thank you to all of the panelists. And I appreciate your persistence and your courage in dealing with um, a part of the reality of working in countries which have uh, disadvantages uh, that translate into, into power. Uh, we have a recording, clearly, which we will make available by the end of the week. I think we can also make an effort to have uh, the voices uh, of Sister Eugenia and Father Charlie that we will be able to make available also. Uh, but I think, Eric, you've done a masterful job in providing us both with the factual background, why the religious communities are involved, and our, our hopes, but also uh, our insistence that these issues take priority as the G20 meets uh, in uh, Rio de Janeiro in, in November, and our commitment to working with the South African religious leaders, the South African authorities, and the African Union leaders as we look forward to the year ahead. Thank you, Eric. Thank you very much, Catherine. And we want to offer a special thanks to the vital work of the G20 Interfaith Forum, which has created a growing platform for the voice of faith community to directly connect uh, with the major decision makers of the G20 uh, and uh, the International Monetary Fund. Uh, we want to offer a special thank you uh, for Sister Eugenia, Father Charlie, uh, Dr. Mercy, uh, and um, Hajim Amir Ahmed uh, for joining us today. Um, your insights have been incredibly important as the faith community grows its own expertise as we continue our pilgrimage to Canada, as we continue our pilgrimage to Brazil, as we continue our pilgrimage to South Africa, as we continue our pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. for International Monetary Fund meetings. The insights have been very rich and critical uh, as we move forward with this call to be on pilgrimage, to go with God, and to build a world, to live into a world where we're all protected from having too little or too much and our planet can be healed. Thank you for joining us today. God bless.